welcome. Everyone, welcome to Macayos for the very first archaeology cafe to be held in Phoenix. We are being co-sponsored here through a grant by the Arizona Humanities Council. Uh, Archaeology Cafe is something that we've been doing for now. We're in our sixth season down in Tucson. I'm Bill Dolly, the president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest, a nonprofit group based in Tucson, and that works across the entire Southwest and Mexican Northwest to try to promote what we call preservation archaeology. And the archaeology the Archaeology Cafe concept is part of the Science Cafe concept, which brings people together in a very informal environment like this and brings one or two speakers with their uh, enthusiasm for their topic, asks them to share that information about what they're currently doing, and in a very, we're calling this a jargon-free zone. So. Tonight's uh, format we've actually set up as a debate over the issue of the population. This is a very informal setting. We want to keep you ordering food, and um, so the wait staff does not have to say excuse me when they walk in front of the speakers. So um, the the, the goal is for the, the speakers to uh, make their uh, case on an interesting topic, which is the uh, decline of population up here in the, the Phoenix Basin. And we've called this Hohokam Hardball, the uh, debate on the Hohokam Decline. And we have uh, Jeff Clark from Archaeology Southwest and Doug Craig from Northland Research. There was actually a time when the two of them worked together in the past, so they are. I'm not going to have to stand between them, actually, to keep them uh, civil. Um, but they've, they're taking a lot of uh, interesting views of this, some of the same information and uh, taking a little bit different approaches, and they're going to share that information with you here tonight. We will have an opportunity to do uh, question and answer. When we get to that point, uh, please uh, raise your hand. I will bring the microphone to you. We are recording this. Uh, part of the uh, deal with the Arizona Humanities Council is that uh, a, we will post these uh, videos on our website, and we will also be delivering a copy to the Arizona Humanities Council. So uh, this is, again, as we drove up to, to uh, Phoenix today, it was like, Will this be a total flop? Will anybody come? <laughs> Thank you all for uh, taking those fears away from us. This is exactly the kind of turnout we, we wanted to see. And uh, at, with, at this point, I will turn things over to Jeff Clark to begin the debate. And again, in about uh, less than half an hour or so, we'll, we'll let you uh, join the process. If you aren't going to be comfortable uh, speaking into the microphone, uh, there are on your table um, little pads of, of paper and some pens, so I can we'll be able to pick up a, a question and, and present it to the to the speakers. So uh, jot down those questions as we're we're speaking here. So without further ado, I'm going to start things off with Jeff Clark. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to quickly go through a pretty complex model here. So if I omit something, please uh, refer to the handouts uh, that you have. Uh, that uh, The three-page handout is the one that I, I have provided. Um, there are basically two kinds of end-of-society models. Um, there are uh, collapse models where you have a, a fairly sudden and rapid uh, catastrophe happen, usually responsible, uh, one variable is usually responsible. Um, uh, it could be a flood, it could be a, a volcanic eruption, a, a tsunami, uh, any kind of a, 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 a really rapid event. And it's generally kind of a one-cause model. Um, 
for the lower salt, uh, uh, for example, um, people have posited that in the mid 1300s, based on treating evidence, uh, there was a huge flood that wiped out irrigation systems here, and that pretty much caused the end of the uh, the Horocom and the classic period or the late pre-contact period, this period from 1200 to, to 1450 AD. Um, and uh, that would be an, an example of a, a catastrophe theory. Um, another theory um, uh, that would be along those lines would be that there wasn't really much of a decline until the Spanish came and then there was a, a rapid uh, uh, introduction of European diseases and a rapid die-off of Native American populations. That would be another collapse kind of model. On the other hand, on the other spectrum, you have um, sort of gradual decline models where you have sort of drawn out processes of decline over time. And there's usually multiple variables that kind of are, are interacting. And that's the kind of model that uh, we will be proposing tonight, or at least um, I will be, uh, for the collapse of the, uh, or the decline of the, of the whole common in the Lower Salt Valley. Um, one of these variables is um, internal population growth. Um, from about maybe, it's hard, it's hard to predict how early, but going all the way up until about 1200 AD, we have uh, in our population reconstructions, it looks like there's gradual population growth in the, uh, in the Lower Salt Valley. Um, by the late 1200s, early 1300s, the Lower Salt Valley is by far, the, and by our reconstructions, the most densely populated uh, area of the Southwest with maybe tens of thousands of people living here. Um, and uh, by this period, they're building massive adobe compounds. Uh, they're building these platform mounds like you see at Pueblo Grande. And they're also building the largest irrigation systems uh, that we know of in, in North America. And you can look at those on your next, on your figure two, figure one is the second page of the handout. Those white lines on the, on those, uh, uh, on that figure. And many of you have probably seen that figure before. It's drawn by, from a number of people. Um, but um, um, that's the most massive uh, canal network in, in North America. So you have this very high population density, and maybe even the beginning of real population pressure um, in the uh, what's called the Holocom core region, which the lower salt is, is part of. At the same time, uh, in the area that we kind of define as the Holocom periphery, which is not Chandler and Mesa, but more uh, um, the Tonto Basin, where Roosevelt Lake is, and Perry Mesa, the San Pedro Valley, the Safford Basin, and even the Tucson Basin, um, we see a lot of transformation there um, and not going the way of the core. Um, Earlier on in the so-called Holocom colonial period, which is about 750 to about 950 AD, um, there's a lot of uh, core influence on the periphery. And whenever the periphery is having, uh, the core is having maybe population problems or groups want to leave, they have pretty ready access uh, to moving into uh, areas in the periphery. This is all changing in the 1200s and early 1300s. Uh, we see evidence of ancestral Puebloan immigration into these periphery areas. In some areas, that's causing conflict with local groups and other areas. Um, we're seeing the formation of new religions and ideologies uh, that are kind of isolating the lower salt from what, what was its port or its former periphery. Um, so that if there's population pressure going on in the core region or in the lower salt, uh, they can't shut population off easily into the periphery. That, that option is lost to them. They've got to try to solve their problems in place in the lower salt valley. And that's what we think they're not doing very well, um, in, particularly in this period from about 1300 to uh, uh, 1400. So uh, going back to the core, or to the Lower Salt Valley, um, if you look at your, your figure, your, that first figure, the second page of your handout, um, you notice that there are two very large canal systems, Canal System 1 and uh, Canal System 2, um, one, to, one to the south of the salt and two to the, to the north. Um, and uh, particularly the, uh, if you look at uh, where Pueblo Grande is, you can see that the intake connect, uh, locations are fairly uh, restricted in terms of where you can take water and draw water off uh, and, and along um, um, that canal system. And with these intake uh, systems relatively fixed, um, 
that leads to only limited options of where you can do agricultural, um, uh, where, you, where your fields can be around those intake locations. As you go further and further away from the intake options, you have uh, uh, further and further away from the intakes, you have more and more options for, for uh, spreading out your fields. But right around these intake uh, uh, areas, there's, uh, there's kind of restricted uh, areas where these fields are. These, these areas around the intakes would be ideal. You have very rich agricultural soils in the floodplain, and you don't have to go very far from the intakes to um, 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 uh, bring water to the field. So they're actually the most advantageous areas, but they're also, in some ways, the most, uh, uh, the least sustainable and the most uh, easiest to, to not to have long-term problems with as you continually using these optimal fields you can they may be prone to water logging salinization silting etc and um, that kind of dark brown um, um, shading on on figure on that uh, sec that first figure are deposits met by a guy named Means in 1901 called the Salt River Adobes. And he called them the Salt River Adobes because they were such massive, thick, and, and heavily um, um, compacted deposits that um, they were just like adobe, um, used for construction, but they were essentially in the fields. In fact, Anglo farmers had problems uh, plowing them and, and, um, and, and draining them. And if you look at those locations, they're actually near some of the intakes of, uh, near the intakes of the, the massive uh, canal systems one and two, one near Pueblo Grande and the other one near Mesa Grande. Those are the two intake settlements um, uh, for each of the major canal systems. Um, if these Salt River adobes, if they're having other problems, um, basically um, um, sustaining uh, agricultural activities near these intakes, they would have had to then go further along the, uh, the uh, canal systems and make the canal systems go further and, uh, um, and um, to, uh, to reach the, to, to basically put new fields and new cultivation. And essentially, um, I think in the, in, in the uh, lower cell, it's, it's the only area where these canal systems actually climb out of the floodplain and onto the uh, terraces above the floodplain. And on these terraces, you can then, you have a lot of option uh, to, uh, to do agriculture, to move laterally and uh, change your fields. But you've also increased your labor demands to, um, um, to farm these fields. Not only have you have in increased um, length of your canal systems to get up onto these terraces, the land on these terraces isn't quite as good as the floodplain. So you may have more options, you, you may have more longer term possibilities in terms of um, doing agriculture further away from the intakes, but you're also increasing your labor demands. Um, so as these fields, we think, are moving away from the intake settlements uh, around uh, Mesa Grande and Pueblo Grande, um, we think population is following where the fields are, because that's where um, the maximum labor should be expended, where you're actually doing the agricultural activities. You need a little settlement near the uh, intake to control the intake, and you need to maintain the canals going to your fields, and then uh, the, most of your population should be uh, near the fields. And if you look at that last figure, um, it's basically showing a, a population density through time, the, that last page of the handout. And um, in our population reconstructions for the region, we're actually seeing this kind of drift of population from intake settlements uh, towards uh, settlements at the end of the, of the um, canal systems through time from this 1200 to 1450 uh, time period. So this process of population movement from intake to kind of tail end settlement is, is going on at the same time the overall labor demands to maintain these, these large systems is increasing. Um, so we've got that going on. Um, also, we think at this time, in general, there's uh, some major concerns with health. There's evidence for uh, over-exploitation of animals uh, um, and limited access to meat. There may be some um, um, evidence for uh, poor health in the burial, con uh, in the burial populations. Uh, but essentially, um, we think that health conditions are declining during this time period. This is causing a population decline that's gradual and somewhat insidious because it's, it's just a f if you change the fertility rate and decrease that a few percent and increase the mortality rate a few percent, you can change this growth curve into a curve of gradual decline. 
So as labor is increasing in terms of maintaining these, these uh, canal systems one and two, um, we have what we think going on probably around 1325 to 1350 is a gradual decline in population that may have been very imperceptible to the, to the inhabitants themselves. But eventually we're in this cycle of increasing labor to maintain these canal systems, but declining population. And this cycle at some point would have been, um, um, they would have noticed it in, 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 at some point during the interval that there would have been a critical threshold that would have been reached where they were just having trouble maintaining these large canal systems with a declining population. So at that threshold point, they had two options to either radically change their, um, um, their, their subsistence and the way they were doing things, or just continue to do the same thing harder. And that's, they, they seem to take that second choice, just trying to do the same thing harder until pretty much the bitter end. And one thing that we think that they're doing, um, um, that by the late 1300s, they, they don't have enough population internally to um, um, maintain these systems. They're now growing on peripheral areas and bringing populations in um, from perhaps the Yuma region, uh, these, these, these groups that are in the periphery that are now being influenced by uh, ancestral Puebloan immigrants. The descendants of these ancestral Puebloan immigrants, we see evidence of these groups moving into the tail end settlements at uh, uh, Los Muertos in System 1 and, uh, and um, um, Las Colinas at, at, at System 2. So we have this shift in population from the intake settlements to the tail end settlements, and, and, and in addition, we have these new populations ending, um, ending up at these tail end settlements. Um, and um, so they're, they're trying to deal with declining population to maintain these two large canal systems. And at the end, um, uh, we have. Um, this, this is the situation where you have still declining population, and um, um, now we have a more socially diverse population. Um, um, we have a reversal of, of the power of intake settlements, which are now shrinking, Mesa Grande and uh, Pueblo Grande, and we have the tail end settlements increasing. And at the same time, we have something that I think called, Doug calls cheater settlements that are, are, are uh, Pueblo Cerrado on, on your first figure would be one of them. Um, that's people that are deciding not to either participate in either of those canal systems and setting themselves up in the floodplain and establishing their own little settlements. So um, um, by 1400 or so, we have um, a, a fairly complex social situation um, where we've got immigrants, we've got local groups that are choosing to participate and not participating in these canal systems, you have sort of a, a fairly uh, chaotic social situation while you're still having this, this, this kind of cycle of, of gradual population decline. And also during this interval, you're having uh, in the treatment record, there is evidence of, of droughts and floods. Under normal conditions, these droughts and floods with healthy, resilient societies, these societies would have been able to um, 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 basically um, deal with these problems. But in this, in this situation, um, the, the, the fragileness of the social setting, they did not deal with these floods and, uh, and these droughts and these environmental problems. And um, ultimately, by the early 1400s, we have a very small population in the region that just cannot support and maintain uh, con these two large canal systems. So they start looking for other options, and their other options are basically to leave the area and uh, go to areas where they have uh, relations with. So um, we, we think we see immigration to the middle Gila River where Brick is, uh, the Gila River Indian community, maybe to the lower Colorado Valley. And um, some of these uh, ancestral Puebloan groups that we think that are moving into the tail end settlements are actually going back to maybe Hopi and Zuni. So we have a, a fairly complete depopulation of the lower salt region by, we think, the, certainly by 1450. And at that time, um, 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 the population is well below the carrying capacity. People have basically decided to get the hell out of Dodge at this point. And um, this is the, the, pretty much the situation uh, when Father Kino arrives and, and um, documents the area in the early 17th century. You have virtually no uh, uh, villages or people living in the Lower Salt. So hopefully I conveyed this 
uh, kind of complex model. Um, but once again, multivariable drawn out over time in a number of, of, uh, of variables, particularly internal population pressure and um, um, this loss of the periphery, so you have to deal with problems internally, and they just didn't deal with those problems very well. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, I, I thank uh, Bill and, and Jeff and everyone in Archaeology Southwest for the invite to speak tonight. Uh, as Bill mentioned, Jeff and I have known each other for a long time, uh, close to 25 years, I figure. Uh, We've worked together on a number of projects. Perhaps most notably, we excavated a, uh, an early to middle classic period platform mound settlement in the Tano Basin about 20 years ago, and we've stayed in touch ever since. And about a decade or so when uh, the folks at what was then Desert Archaeology, now Archaeology Southwest, started assembling this model of Hohokam collapse, um, my main interaction or discussions with Jeff at that point were uh, to sort of poke holes into his arguments. I had nothing invested in it, and so it was just fun to, to kibitz, okay? And eventually, Jeff, I think, got tired of me kibitzing, and, and we agreed that the best way to sort of deal with this was to, um, at one level, have a, a big symposium where we got sort of people supporting our respective positions, and last year, in Sacramento at the Society for American Archaeology meetings. Uh, we had a symposium where, again, Jeff sort of marshaled uh, supporters of the, the core decay model that he just talked about. And my responsibility was to sort of marshal or pull together the loyal opposition. <laughs> okay, And again, I'll be the, sort of the first to admit that there, there's a lot about um, what's going on in late classic period Hocom society that I'm not really sure of. And what I'm going to try to do tonight is continue to poke holes in his model, for one thing, <laughs> but, but also actually take the step of uh, throwing out some alternatives. I mean, it's, it's great to kibitz up to a point, but eventually you have to play the game yourself. And so uh, I'll sort of tell you how I got to the positions that I've reached uh, and sort of build on some of the comments he made and see if we can't sort of elicit a little conversation. Uh, let's see, got to take a quick look at my, my crib notes. Um, in, in terms of just a, a few quick words on the symposium that we organized last year at the SAA, it, it really was a huge success. We, it was well attended. We got uh, I think it generated a lot of buzz. People, just like you're probably here tonight, you know, a lot of times when a, uh, an archaeological reconstruction and interpretation comes out, you sort of get a nice, simple narrative. I mean, we all like a good story, and each of us were sort of telling our stories, and, and, and the symposium at last year's SEA has provided us a chance to sort of really listen carefully to some of the nuances of each other's arguments. And even if we didn't agree on everything, a lot more came out in the open and we could sort of go from there. So it, it was a very beneficial uh, event. Um, I'm sort of handicapped tonight because a lot of the people that I'd sort of pulled together for my team uh, we're making arguments of things I didn't really know a lot about, and I'm sort of, you're stuck with me tonight, okay? Um, hopefully we'll get some people like Len Rice, who participated in the symposium, and many other professional archaeologists who, uh, who are here, who um, may not have a stake in the issue, but certainly have an opinion on the issue of what happened to the Hohokam. And while Jeff talked mainly about what happened here in the the Lower Salt River Valley, and my guess is that many of you living here in Phoenix think the Lower Salt River Valley is Hohokam. That's not the case from my perspective. When I think of the Hohokam, I think of a very large area in, in southern and central Arizona, and I think it's important that even though some of Jeff's ideas uh, seem to work, uh, or maybe one can make sense of them within the Lower Salt, I think it's also important to try to explain the whole Hohokam region 
um, which uh, is roughly the size of South Carolina. So what happened here in Phoenix is, is important and interesting, especially given that sort of what led up to the collapse, uh, and, and I'll use that term, I, we're, we're sort of being politically correct now and sort of using Hocom demise, but um, for the most part, I mean, I think how most of the, uh, the public views the end of the Hocom sequence is, is collapse. And I'm also gonna sort of be making some reference to, I don't know how many of you have read uh, Jared Diamond's book on, on collapse, but it, it certainly has brought what happened prehistorically into the forefront of people's minds because um, sort of his basic argument is that human-induced environmental degradation leads to, invariably in a lot of civilizations, has led to a complete breakdown of the social order and demographic collapse, a real sharp decline in, in population. And the one thing that I'm gonna be doing a little different tonight than I did in Sacramento is that uh, I will be sticking my neck out on the line a little and trying to give you my particular spin on what was going on or what may have been going on and why I think sort of this diamond-esque model of complete social breakdown and the Archaeology Southwest model of significant demographic collapse is, is, is overstated. So, okay, with, with that, um, let, let me start, because um, we really do want your opinions, and I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, these other professionals and, and the, the public are out here, what, what you have to say. Um, I'll go right into some of my quibbles with, with, with Jeff as, 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 as to their model. Um, where to begin? Uh, page one, page, no. Um, first one, a fairly easy one to deal with. And again, some of the ideas I'm, I'm throwing out, I don't take personal credit for them. They're, um, in part, I'm trying to express some of the sentiments um, on my loyal opposition team, okay? And so I'll be echoing their uh, arguments and one has to do with the declining health of the uh, late classic period in, in, in the Phoenix Basin. And a lot of um, the interpretation that Jeff was talking about where uh, you're getting into a situation of increased dietary stress, uh, overexploitation of local resources, basically leading to nutritional deficiencies and poor health of the population, it's been called into question in recent years. And again, for those of you who may be familiar with a lot of the work that came out of the SSI excavations of Pueblo Grande in the late 80s, published in the 90s, um, this may come as somewhat surprise. I mean, I remember the first time that I heard Corey Bretternitz at a PECOS conference say the line that the average age of death at Pueblo Grande was birth. It's like, whoa, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, they, these people, again, the argument was they're really unhealthy. Now, I mean, that, that's devastating if that was, was the case. Um, whereas these recent studies, they've gone back and they've looked, a number of researchers, um, Laura Lincoln Babb, uh, Becky Hill, John McClellan, who gave our gave paper uh, at the SAA conference, basically have argued that this, it's, it's overstating the situation, that it was not as grim as it appeared. Um, I think what, what was done on the early SSI um, in the reports was they presented a bunch of life expectancy tables, similar to a, an actuary might pull together for a modern insurance company. And sure enough, when you were born at Pueblo Grande, the argument was you had a expectancy of living to about 15 years of age if you made it past the first few years. But that was the average age of death, or, or the modal okay, uh, age of death was about 15.7 years. Again, a pretty grim prospectus. Um, whereas throughout, in many other parts of the Southwest, the average age, again, because infant mortality is an issue, 
um, in many sort of third world situations that average age at many other sites in the Southwest is sort of between 20 and 30. Again, not necessarily um, like modern society, but, but fairly typical of, of third world countries. And what uh, the re of the reexamination of the SSI data found, uh, as well as analyses of many, many more burials from work at Pueblo Grande, is that the age was cl probably closer to 25 or 27. So well within the so, sort of the figures for many other sites in the Southwest. So, so one thing I quibble with very much now is this notion of uh, that things were getting much, much worse. And also, sort of related to that, um, again, if we go beyond the Phoenix Basin and look at what we're calling Hohokam, which could include um, platform mound settlements throughout southern and central Arizona, um, we don't find the over-exploitation of local resources. I recently excavated a site in Tucson, and they were doing plenty of hunting in the late 1300s. I mean, this was along the Santa Cruz, where people had not only been farming for 3,000 years, but they, they've been irrigating for 3,000 years as well. So uh, again, I, I, I think we need to sort of step back from this notion that uh, health was, or, or declining health, uh, was a major issue in the, in the decline. Now, in, in, in terms of other ones, let me, let me see what I've got. Uh, I've, I've, I've got a, um, a one-page handout, and for those of you, let me see if I can find it. Uh, okay, it's this one with a bunch of bar graphs and a, and a, and a graph on it as well, bar charts and a graph. And, and what I did for my paper at the SAA was um, Jeff and, and Bill very graciously provided me access to the Coalescent Community Database, which is the basis for those maps that you see in Jeff's handout, which shows basically a depopulation of the entire southern southwest by about 1450. And the things to look at on, on, on my handout, the first thing is the graph in the upper left hand portion of the handout. And for those of you who may not have it, I, I only um, made about 50 copies, and obviously there are a lot more than 50 of you here. Um, and when I looked at this graph the first time, uh, and this was published uh, by Jeff and colleagues in an American Antiquity article in 2004, so it certainly has received a lot of attention, gotten a lot of play. And if you look at it, you can see the precipitous drop in population uh, for the Hocom population, uh, for the Hocom area, the whole southern southwest from the late 1300s to uh, 1450. And then by 1500, the argument is essentially no one is here, or at least no one is archaeologically visible in the entire southern southwest. In contrast, the other slightly more gradual curve, certainly it's going up closer to 1500 and then dropping off, is the curve that they generated for the northern southwest. Okay, so somehow they've got data that suggests that people are disappearing or populations declining at a much more precipitous, alarming rate in the southern southwest than it is in the northern southwest. I don't buy it. Um, for, 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 one, for one thing, their, um, their population estimates are based on room counts. And for any of you who know Pueblos, it's pretty easy to count a room. You don't have to dig. You can sort of go along the surface and count, count rooms. Here in the southern southwest, we have a lot bigger problem with that. For one thing, how do you get room counts from mounds of dirt? which is pretty much what these large uh, platform mounds or even compounds look like archaeologically. You have to do a lot of excavation to sort of generate room counts. So what I've done here on the two bar charts on the right is basically taken their data for the Hohokam region. And I've, I've sort of separated it out one by when were sites abandoned and secondly, when were rooms abandoned? 
Okay, and again, they've done an amazing job, and, and, and I really don't, I, I don't want to b belittle it at all. Um, it's a very impressive database. I think it's based on, or at least when I was looking at it, it was based on about 3,000 sites. Every site in the greater Southwest that was occupied from 1,200 to 1,700 that had, I believe, more than 12 rooms. So it's looking at sites, you know, medium size and large sites across a vast area. But my argument to Jeff, and this was back when I was uh, kibitzing and needling him, was that um, it's not that accurate for the southern southwest, that there are, there are some major issues. At the same time, I think what the graphs really show very, very well is that what happened right around 1300, the late 1200s and going into 1300, is that there was aggregation. The people, there were many fewer sites being lived in, but the population at any one site or most sites was mar much larger. So I thought, I think what, this, what their database shows is the process of aggregation, not necessarily population decline. Okay, so then on top of all that, I was excavating a bunch of sites, um, first down in Tucson and then with a, uh, a colleague at Northland uh, up near Florence along the Gila. And again, I realize we're leaving the lower salt, so, so bear with me for a second. But what we found in either floodplain settings or upland settings um, were a lot of pit house settlements. And not only that, but we were getting good indications that these pit house settlements were occupied well into the 1400s. Now this is based on radiocarbon dates, archaeomagnetic dates, and one of the great um, sort of results from, I think, the, the work that Archaeology Southwest has done on their, uh, for their efforts is the, um, the presence of a, of a decorated pottery type called cliff polychrome. It's a very late salado polychrome that probably wasn't produced till after 1350 or after 1370. And we were finding that at, at our sites as well. So in part, one of the first things I started questioning on their model was how representative was their sample of things that were going on after about 1350, 1370? Because if people weren't living in surface rooms at large aggregated sites, but were living in more dispersed settlements with lots of buried pit houses that the only way we can find out about them is to excavate them. You just can't walk along the surface and go, oh, there are 100 houses here. It, it, it's just not that easy. Um, how is that sort of figured into their model? And so what I've done on the, the bar chart on the lower right, or excuse me, the lower left, is I've taken a portion of what they sort of said ended at about 1400, moved it to later, and then tried to also come up with a way of maybe adding a bunch of sites that aren't even in their database. Even though, again, they have this amazing database, they're still missing a lot of sites. And in particular, the sites they're missing are those with low visibility. And sort of a central theme of uh, sort of my comments today have to do with sort of the dangers of making interpretations when you're looking at things that have very, very low visibility. And in my case, what I was looking at was architecture, sort of, and pit houses are much lower visibility than um, the compounds with surface rooms uh, and certainly platform mounds, even though there you're still dealing with piles of dirt. Okay, so what I concluded from that is that there really are a lot more people at least going to 1450, okay? A lot more people in the Southern Southwest at 1450 than they're willing to recognize. And not only that, but some of these dates, at, Jeff mentioned the site of Pueblo Salado, which I call the cheater settlement because it's not part of the Big Canal System too here in the Lower Salt, but it's much closer to the river. And it seems to have really taken off once Pueblo Grande. Maybe it hasn't bit the dust, but it's certainly in, in, in serious decline. And there are dates on that that are going into the 1500s. So basically, my big conclusion in terms of population is I'm not convinced that what you see for the whole Hohokam area 
is all that different from the Pueblo area. And a big part of their argument is that what was happening here in the Lower Salt and other parts of the Hohokam region happened before the Spanish came. So to introduce disease could not account for the, the, um, the nature of the population decline. Again, I question that. I, I, I think the evidence is, is still out there. And, and again, part of what um, sort of my quibbles are that uh, a lot of what they were saying is their interpretations are premature. Um, just real quickly, because I, I really want to give you guys an opportunity to sort of ask us questions uh, and, uh, you know, sort, sort of generate some conversation on this, is I think some of the uh, emphasis on the, the role of Pueblo and influence has been overstated. Uh, there are other immigrant groups that came in, and a key element of any irrigation system, uh, I don't think it's any surprise that the immigrant groups were placed on the margins of the system. I mean, if you're running an irrigation system, you want to ensure that you don't have cheaters as much as possible. You have to be exclusive to the members of that irrigation system, and I don't see the opportunity for the folks at the end of the canal system basically uh, exerting the level of influence that uh, they did. And then sort of just one other real quick comment before I throw out a, a few alternatives on this is um, I think there, there's not only too much emphasis in their model on high visibility sites, but on high visibility artifacts. And it's, it's great when you got decorated ceramics but late in prehistory, not only in the southern southwest, northern Mexico, for example, you get a shift from decorated ceramics to a lot of plainwares and a lot of redwares. And we have lots of examples from our work throughout the southwest over time that visibility really counts and in terms of one's interpretations. That uh, low visibility sites tend to get ignored, high visibility sites a lot of emphasis is placed on them. So, okay, so just really quickly so we can generate some conversation. What do I think might have happened? Okay. Um, the first thing I think you need to realize is in terms of what happened after 1300 is have a sense of what happened leading up to 1300, okay? And I sort of see three key processes. One is that aggregation, population aggregation, which those graphs and which we all agree on that leading up to 1300, Fewer sites with a lot more people. So that's one key element. Um, let's see, uh, another one is that on, in many areas, and perhaps less here along the lower salt, and I've thrown out to many of you who may know the data better than me, uh, that there seems to be a consolidation of small canal systems into larger canal systems. This certainly went on along the Gila River. Uh, I've done work at the Gru site. Uh, the, the ancestral village to Casa Grande ruins, and early on during the pre-classic period, it seems like there was a small canal system that service grew, and then later in time when Casa Grande ruins was occupied, you had this long, 20 mile long canal. So they're joining up canal systems to form, they're consolidating them to form longer canals. You see this in the Santan Snake Town area, Casablanca area as well. And then finally, platform mounds are an example I think of the emergence of an exclusive, where political institutions that sort of emphasize exclusivity as opposed to ball courts, which the general interpretation is that they're more inclusive. So these sort of three developments that I'll say, aggregation, canal consolidation, and the emergence of exclusionary, exclusionary political institutions all occurred between 1100 and 1300. So that's what's leading up to this, okay? Um, and rather than sort of looking at Jared Diamond for inspiration uh, and, 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 and seeing how human-caused environmental degradation might have led to a breakdown of social, social order, um, I'm sort of more swayed by political scientists like Harvard's James Robinson and others who've examined um, political reasons for a breakup in large uh, social systems and nations. And one of the big things that they've argued is that um, more sustainable political institutions are those that are more inclusive. 
So I think the mistake that may have been made in late prehistory was not only the population aggregation, but also um, the shift from an inclusive political system to a more exclusive system. And then just two other quick points uh, before we turn it out is that the overall settlement pattern that we see at about 1370 and after that bears a lot of parallels to um, what we see along the middle Gila in ethno-historic times, particularly the 19th century. And that is a system of village drift, where these villages are still tethered to canal systems, but not in one place like they are during, particularly the Hohokam pre-classic, that period from about 500 to 1100, where it really seems that you could set up a large settlement on an upper terrace, farm the floodplain below, and you could have some assurance that those fields were going to be there year after year. Once that changes, uh, canal irrigation is still important, but people are moving around that settlement. And as a result, again, it's a much lower visibility pattern that you see. Um, and so basically, uh, and, and then one other thing is I, I suggest that we need to keep looking at alluvial cycles, which are these periods along rivers um, of basically erosion, down cutting, followed by aggregation, and um, basically stability in the river channels. And one thing we sort of found throughout prehistory is that when landforms are stable, people stay in one place. When landforms are unstable, they move around. And so if those river channels were moving a lot or didn't have the same level of stability as we saw in earlier times, it makes sense that people are moving around in this village drift system. So that's pretty much my, my main argument. But I, I, I sort of see that we're, we're missing the point when we talk about um, sort of a breakdown in social order and whole-scale demographic collapse. I, I think it's a much more subtle pattern, and it's something that we need to think of in terms of leading into proto-history and ethno-history. So with that, I'll turn it over. <laughs> there you have two, two views of the world. And um, now we're ready to turn the questions over to you. And I will bring the microphone to you. If um, And again, uh, please speak into the microphone or raise your hand, and I will um, read a question if you don't feel comfortable um, delivering it yourself. Here we go. My question is, uh, in the Tucson area, were the populations at some of these villages smaller than they were here? Would that affect the idea that there was more game and more variability in the Tucson area than the Phoenix area? Um, I'll, I'll be glad to throw that one out since I made the comment to begin with. Um, yes. No, 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 no. no I'm, 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 I'm just kidding. Um, no, they were certainly smaller scale, but we're still talking about some pretty large villages. And the other thing in the, I mean, large villages that when, when Father Kino came, uh, the, the small site that I excavated, um, called the Riedo Fan Site, um, when Father Kino came in the 1690s, he found uh, an Adam village right in the same location. It's where the Riedo Creek, uh, the confluence with the Santa Cruz River. And I think he had 700 or 800 people at that village at that time. Now, even the largest villages here in the, the, the Lower Salt, I mean, I'm guessing, I, I don't really know, but I know from the, the Middle Gila that if, if Pueblo Grande had 2,000 people or 2,500 people, that would have been a lot. So yes, it is a difference in scale. But given that in Tucson, we also know that they were irrigating farming intensively beginning at about 2000 BC, and we have canals at 1500 BC, they had a lot of time to do a lot of damage, okay? And it doesn't appear that they did. And again, from a visibility standpoint, that site I mentioned in, in Tucson where um, Kino records a large population living there, there's virtually nothing visible today. There's one, one small little section of the site that may still be preserved. But what we were digging, were, 
uh, again, houses going into the 1400s with plow scars along the floor. So if there was anything later, strongly suspect they were just taken out. And I would almost see that village that we excavated as a pretty good candidate for something that was occupied continuously from prehistoric times to when Kino came. And again, I, I, I can't demonstrate that, but um, uh, it, I have no reason to, to argue, you know, I mean, to, to sort of see that why they would have abandoned it. So. Um, I think I'd like to follow up on the question of um, um, continuity between, um, we can go to the Tucson Basin, but we could go other places as well, between the uh, proto-historic and this late classic period. I think uh, the sites that Doug had been talking about, this, this return reversion to pit houses that's going on late in time, is important. And actually, it actually somewhat plays into our model because we were having a somewhat, just using above ground masonry architecture and trying to account, account adobe rooms and platform mounds and whatever, we were seeing a more rapid population loss than we liked in the 1350 to 1450 range. Now, if some people are reverting to pit houses, depending on how many, it, it slows that, 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 that process down. Um, and that's the big question. I mean, how many, we have a, we have a pretty good beat of where the major pre-classic pit house settlements were in the whole Com region. And now we're going back to pit houses, which are harder to see on the surface, but once you start looking for them, you start finding them uh, in trenching and CRM projects. And these pit houses, I think that Doug are talking about, are chunky jam full with uh, a, a type of pottery that's very important called Salada Polychrome, which we use to date um, one of our, our primary dating tools um, uh, for this time period. And, and nobody in the Southwest that I know of dates uh, Salada Polychromes, including the types that he's talking to about, past 1450 AD. So if you have Salada Polychromes in these pit houses, um, and, and you're trying to push the dates later, that would be, um, you'd be bucking the, the convention. So, I mean, you can argue that there's a missing a link in that plow zone that would be between Father Kino's settlement and then that pit house settlement that I think has a lot of polychromes, but it ain't there. I mean, it could be there, but it, you don't have no evidence of it. If we go elsewhere, in the San Pedro Valley, we're going, we're, we're now ranging well beyond the lower salt. Um, it's extremely hard to find even a, a pit house that um, has a, a date that isn't associated with Salado polychromes or has a date that fits between 1450 and 1650. When you start picking up proto-historic settlement, let's say in the San Pedro Valley, um, we have uh, settlements that have been excavated. They all have European artifacts. They all look very ephemeral. They look like Apache wiki ups almost. So we have a, 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 a real gap period there of from about 1450 to 1650 that isn't filled by very much. And um, you can argue that it's a pure plain wear period. You can argue a, a lot of negative evidence, but a lot of people have looked very hard for this gap period in southern Arizona, and very few structures have fallen into that gap period. So. Another question. I'm interested in what roughly you characterize the boundaries of the Hohokam. You said it's like South Carolina. Where did they run from? And two. East, west, north, south. Okay. Um, north, well, south, U.S. Mexico border, pretty close to it. Um, east, Safford Basin, west, Gila Bend, and north, wherever you wanted to find the northern periphery, certainly going up to the Cave Creek area, and uh, and, and and probably a little beyond. Um, but but that's pretty. Those are pretty much the the limits. And you know, of course, it changes somewhat over time, and in some it. Other, sometimes it's probably more expansive than that, but I think there's general consensus. Gila Bend to Safford, international border to north of Phoenix. I can move around pretty quickly here, so if there are folks in the back, don't uh, hesitate to raise your hand. I'll get you the microphone. Yeah. There's a, a lot of um, Don Autumn and Pima songs that have been recorded and stories um, in ethno-historic times and, and more recently. And some of those are still sung that talk about the demise of the whole Um And talk about, some of those songs talk about it as a, a deliberate loss of hierarchy by attacking particularly um, villages that were central to the irrigation system and 
ones that had platform mounds. And I'm just, and Kino says when he came into Casa Grande that he could see that both the village surrounding Casa Grande as well as Casa Grande itself had been burned, um, which is talked about in the song. So I'm wondering if there's any archeolo further archeological evidence that there may have been some form of warfare. First, or, I mean, I'll be glad to. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the oral record is very interesting, and including warfare, it also talks about famine, floods, uh, decreased fertility cycles, uh, uh, overextension, uh, uh, too many people uh, in the landscape, also uh, uh, shortened uh, lifespans are talked about in the oral records and also the intrusion of potentially northern groups. And there's these sort of two groups in the, that are prominent in the oral traditions with the Wishgam and the, and the Huhugam, uh, which the word Holocom comes from. But in, in terms of uh, the specific issue of warfare, um, a lot of these late, very late, what we consider, uh, from our perspective, very late Salado sites, they have uh, very late Salado polychromes with them. Um, these final wood blocks, a lot of them, that uh, very few of them have been intensively examined by, by um, modern excavation techniques. You have Howie's work at Los Muertos, and that's certainly an extremely late site. But a lot of these sites are chucky jam full with nice salado polychrome, which is a very Puebloan pottery um, on the floor, so they've been the target of vandalism. Uh, the ones that we have information from suggest that there are very extensive floor assemblages, and there is a degree of burning. So there, is, there may be some sort of um, um, uh, a, a conflict that's going on between groups at the end that's exacerbating environmental and other problems. I forgot to mention warfare. That's another one that. I, that, that, that um, no, I, I, I think your your point's well taken, and actually, I, I that is something that was an oversight in what what I mentioned because I do think that would also contribute to some of the settlement patterns that we're seeing. Um, in, in late, very late prehistory here in the southern southwest. And when uh, I mentioned that, you know, after about 1370, it sure seems that the general pattern is fairly close to uh, what we see in ethno-historic times. Of course, you'd have to deal with Apache raiding during modern, or, you know, the 19th century, the 18th century. And so I, even though there's not a lot of evidence for it, uh, it's sure the evidence, again, this is one of these negative situations where um, <clears throat> there's, you know, there may be no man's lands where people and the Salt River Valley may in part be that. Um, again, we do, I think some of uh, Denny Seymour's work, for example, has shown that the Athabascan uh, intrusions, invasions are happening earlier than a lot of archaeologists had generally supposed. I know when we were doing the work at, at the Gru site, we were also excavating on the outskirts of Casa Grande ruins, and we had one compound um, that we only identified during testing. We had put a backhoe trench through it, and it had, as Jeff has mentioned, salado polychrome on the floor, and a lot of those rooms had burned, just like Kino's records of, uh, of, of the great house itself. And, <clears throat> excuse me, before we were able to go excavate it, which you know, we certainly wanted to, um, our friends at uh, the BIA decided to take a, a blade and uh, strip down through a site and basically damaged the site, which made ADOT, who was funding the project, change their mind as to what they wanted to do in that area. They basically opted not to do, we were not allowed to excavate that compound. So I mean, I think that's a real missed opportunity. But no, I, th I think your point is very well taken. And I would not be shocked, and Glenn um, Rice here <clears throat> could probably comment more on that. but. I think the evidence for increased conflict and warfare late in times uh, is, is, is certainly a factor. And, and again, I, th I think that can account for um, abandonments of some areas or re-shifting of populations to, in a sense, safer areas 
again, much as we see in the 18th and 19th centuries. So, yes. Next question. Do we have one over here? I'm sorry. Need to be taller. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you both for your, your uh, talks. Um, you know, of course, I live here and I've heard about the whole Com canals, but I've never seen a, a map like this, so I found this to be fascinating. And it just led my mind to wondering more about you know this this network that I've heard about for so many years. Um, you know, so I've got a, probably several questions. Um, but you know, one: Are there no canals further downstream that have been found? And if not, why not? Um, and secondly, you know, recognizing that there had to be one canal built first and one canal built last. How would this canal system have been managed given a finite supply of, of water? And uh, given a finite supply of water and the, the seasonal flow, you know, lower flows later in the, into the summer, um, would there have likely been competition for water? You talked to earlier about you know, you know, everybody needing to contribute in order to essentially deserve the water. But it seems that in this environment, water would be one of the uh, leading instigators of conflict and social stress. So I was wondering if you could talk about some of those things. I'll jump in first. Uh, yes, I think there was <clears throat> certainly uh, adjudicating water rights was a big issue prehistorically. Um, I think there's pretty good evidence now. Actually, one question you asked is there evidence for canals farther downstream? And yes, certainly in the Gila Bend area, um, once you get beyond the confluence of the salt and the Gila, we don't find a lot of um, evidence for canals, but that may be just because it hasn't been looked at all that, that much. The, our maps of the lower salt are largely derived from work that was done in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and a lot of that evidence is not that it's not available anymore, but it's difficult to get at. So it's a lot of archival studies along the the Middle Gila, um, Kyle Woodson and the folks at the Gila River Indian community have done a lot of work in recent years documenting the canals along the Middle Gila River. And I think the key thing to keep in mind is that, and this goes back to your point of competition between different canal systems, is that there were probably in total about two dozen separate irrigation communities along the Salt and Gila rivers, about a dozen along the Salt and a dozen along the Gila. And each of these irrigation communities would have had one main canal that basically serviced several settlements. So everybody along that settlement had to get along to some degree and come up with ways of adjudicating water rights. Um, they were probably, for m most of their history, certainly prior to 1100, um, self-managing canal systems, irrigation communities. So you had, in a sense, t two dozen little polities, little city-states, if you will. I mean, to use some Mesopotamian example, where they managed their own system, but they had to somehow come up with a way of getting together and figuring out water rights. Uh, for all the other canal systems. One of the things they did along the Gila, which I know a little better, um, is that it was common to the canal systems that were farther upstream, they would take the water and they would recirculate it back into the river after they'd used it so that the, the Gru Casa Grande system, for example, emptied into McClellan Wash, which is west of Casa Grande ruins, and then it ran back into the Gila River so downstream settlements could access water. At the same time, there must have been years when there was low flow in the Gila that those downstream settlements were SOL, okay? I mean, or at least had real problems in terms of water availability. And Dave Abbott, I think, has made some interesting arguments for the pre-classic period, and I'm not quite sure how it plays out in the classic period, that some of these downstream irrigation communities came up with banking mechanisms to sort of cover themselves when they may not have had full access 
to water in a given year. Namely, they became the potters. Okay, they produced most of the pottery, the buffware pottery that gets distributed throughout southern Arizona is produced along the middle Gila. And most of the settlements, as best we can tell, that produced pottery along the middle Gila were the downstream settlements. So again, maybe this is what they came up with as a way of covering themselves when water wasn't available in, in bad years. But it's quite likely that they, there had to be systems, uh, a political system, for, again, adjudicating water rights between different communities. And that, that level of competition could easily have broken down at some point, especially as it became perhaps more exclusion, exclusionary with platform mound settlements in late prehistory. So again, you're, you're asking you know, really good questions on that, and there's a lot we, we don't know. We can only surmise, and we, you know, it's just been in recent years that we've really nailed down sort of the nature of these different irrigation communities. But uh, it, good, you know, I agree. Um, I pretty much agree with everything Doug said there, and I would also like to point out that upstream, uh, the Safford Basin was also probably maybe even larger than the Tucson Basin with a population, uh, uh, um, and there's certainly um, a lot of the archaeological record in the floodplain there has been destroyed by farming and, and modern um, activity before we were able to investigate it. but. Uh, um, the, the Mormon canal systems there are probably, there are often, there are generally earthen canals probably are following prehistoric canal systems and there was probably a very large population there as well. And just one thing to follow up on, Doug, I, I, these little canal systems probably weren't city states, uh, it's probably pushing the political organization pretty far. Um, <laughs> but, and in, in some cases, um, I mean, if you go to, to Indonesia or other places, it doesn't necessarily take a lot of leadership, or at least hierarchical leadership, to run small canal systems. Um, um, that can be done at a fairly egalitarian level, as long as it doesn't get uh, too big and unwieldy. And another point I would like to make is that there, we have a lot of evidence for interaction, trade, uh, and um, at least in terms of the artifact patterns, that these, some of these canal <laughs> Irrigation communities were actually uh, um, um, cooperating with each other into kind of larger formations that we um, and we'll call uh, districts. So there's interaction between these communities that may be at the political level as well. So. Just one quick follow-up too is um, people really get uh, enthralled or hung up on Hocom canals, and that they're cool. I mean, th there's nothing like it in pre-Hispanic North America. I mean, it, it's the biggest irrigation works uh, that there were. But I think it's also important when you're looking at the HOCOM is to distinguish between water rights and land rights, uh, property rights, because canal systems, successful canal systems, invariably the water is viewed as a common resource. And you do have to come up with a way within the community to adjudicate water rights, to make sure if you were living at Casa Grande and you were at the end of the canal system, you had to make sure water got to your fields from a 20-mile canal system. The land in intensive agricultural systems, even intensive canal irrigation communities, is invariably something along the lines of private ownership. And so I think we have to recognize that there was this long-term dynamic between sort of collective water rights and private land ownership. And I would argue that the sort of the real path to power, and this is some work I've done with, with Kathy Henderson, is that the real path to power in Hocum society may not have been managing the irrigation systems, because you had to get along with everyone to do it, and there were probably enough checks and balances to ensure that you know, some greedy person didn't get too much water. On the other hand, there were probably many fewer checks and balances on how you managed your land rights. And that in terms of a path to power in Hohokam society, seems to me that, that um, ownership of land and transferring land from one generation to the next, sort of the power that came with controlling who got 
your land um, may have been more important in sort of differentiating, separating out the haves from the have-nots. Next question. Behind you, Bill. Ah, sorry. <laughs> what do you think uh, would, if, you, if it was up to you, what would be the focus of research to answer these questions? Dig a lot more sites. <laughs> um, at the site level, I would really like to intensively excavate one of these late Salado sites or one of these late sites that are going into the uh, 14, early 1400s and pick it apart um, in terms of uh, what's going on at the site level. I would also like, in terms of uh, on a more regional scale, to look at areas where we think we have the few precious areas that I, I would say that we think we have a pretty good evidence, uh, at least potentially from the available evidence, that we have some sort of continuity between the prehistoric area, uh, era and the proto-historic era. And that those areas would be areas such as uh, maybe the um, area around the San Javier Mission in Tucson, um, certain areas in the Gila River Indian community um, um, where we think there's uh, continuity, and also maybe places out on in the Tona Adan Reservation, where, there, where I've actually done some survey where you have trash mounds that look like they have both uh, protohistoric and prehistoric shores. But um, the areas that archaeologists have been able to work off of the, the, the nations and reservations, I mean, this continuity has been very elusive. I mean, we, we're, we're at the point where we can really uh, find very subtle archaeological remains, Apache sites, Sabipri sites, very subtle sites, and still, um, you can say, well, maybe it's in the plow zone or whatever, but these missing centuries between 1450 and 1650, there's very precious few structures even that would date to that interval. And even those, are, they're, they're crappy pit houses. I mean, they're little pit houses or whatever. They're, they're, it's, it's, there's something going on when you've got these nice massive ruins that are, that, that are, that are being occupied at, in the 1300s to the 1400s. And, and all you can find between 1450 and 1650 is, is a few little pit houses that date to this interval. Something is going on. And I think it's, while there, there is certainly an, arch, an archaeological visibility problem, I think it is much more than that demographically. So once again, focusing on maybe some of these late sites to try to identify What's going on? Is there a, pl a trend towards plain wear at the end of the Salado horizon where we got all these northern Puebloan uh, polychromes? And look, re look regionally at areas where we think that there's continuity and really see if there is because it's, it's been very hard to find. I, I think Jeff's points are well taken. And um, I, it would be ideal to be able to excavate a site in the floodplain. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of these late sites are. Um, and it would be nice if we could get a large enough sample to really address some of these issues. Uh, unfortunately, the floodplain presents its own problems, not only in, in the Tucson area along the Santa Cruz, which is not as severe as, as along the Salt River. I think that's uh, a lot of those late sites are that were down in the floodplain are probably gone. Um, the Gila River is a possibility, but I, I think the other sort of potential group of sites that may address some of these issues are the upland sites, um, because they aren't destroyed at the same level that the floodplain sites are. And so, again, we excavated or a small portion of a, of a site about six miles south of Florence several years ago, and uh, found in, in an area that was about 1% of the site by area, we found, I think, 12 or 15 houses, which, you know, again, if you play the game and multiply it what's out there, if we were able to excavate more of the site, we may have been able to address some of these issues. But there are still many uh, upland sites, in particular, that fits with ethno-historic patterns of where Oran villages would be. And so uh, to get an opportunity, uh, again, Kathy Henderson's here, and she did a lot of excavations in the Santa Cruz Flats area. And were, they were getting some very late sites. Uh, but unfortunately, again, they sampled, which, because that's where the, the, uh, 
CAP canal distribution system was going through, they sampled a relatively small portion of these much, much larger sites. So even if you don't get to dig, uh, expose a lot of houses at these upland sites, uh, it would certainly be nice to intensively trench it so you could get an idea of uh, just how many houses we're dealing with and see if you can't get to the bottom of some of these issues that, that Jeff's uh, raising. Uh, you know, I, I agree with him that if they're there uh, or, or if people were here, um, they're either in the floodplain or in upland areas and be, we should be able to tackle it. Unfortunately, the, the floodplain, I'm, I'm just less optimistic. I mean, it took us many, many years before we were able to identify an early agricultural component. This is a pre hohokam component beginning in about 2000 BC in the floodplains of the Santa Cruz. As a matter of fact, Jeff was one of the folks many years ago who was going along I-10, found a few lithic artifacts, and even though we were right along I-10, sort of said, oh, you know, I think maybe they should stick in some backhoe trenches here, and lo and behold, they started finding these 2,500-year-old pit houses, and not only that, but large settlements. Now, you can always get to the early stuff because it tends to be low. If, if it's up high in the plow zone, in the floodplain, there's a good chance they're gone. But there should be ways that we can address some of these issues. And, and so playing off the upland data versus the floodplain data is a, is a good place to start. If, if there's a, <clears throat> one more really urgent question, I will uh, bring you the microphone. Donna. Uh, oh. <laughs> um, I'm going to bring up something epiphenomenal. Uh, and, and I thought of it when you mentioned Indonesia, uh, Jeff. So much of the irrigation system in Bali is, works because of religious beliefs. And I was wondering, and as a preservation archaeologist, I want to think about ways of finding out more without doing more excavation, um, if an icon iconographic uh, analysis of pottery or patterns in um, other things that we have already, that we, you know, collections that we already have um, might reveal some information. Certainly, when, when people start talking about, you know, the uh, um, you know, the Kachina cult and that sort of thing. I mean, you're, you're talking about awfully slippery stuff, but it might reveal something that certainly affected the political and social structure um, and, and the disruption of that. Somebody must have loaded that question for you. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, actually, um, I can't speak more, much to the earlier Rodan Buff period, but I can speak to the uh, Salado Polychrome period, which is once again we get these uh, Salado Polychromes that dominate decorated assemblages throughout southern Arizona after 1350 AD. And that's pretty much an ancestral Puebloan technology and design style, and it's widely spread across southern Arizona. And we know from petrographic and uh, other sourcing data that it's produced almost in every river valley. Um, but yet this horizon has a very, uh, this Salado polychrome um, phenomenon horizon has a very, very homogeneous set of icons, the way they, they present them and lay them out, and the way that changes through time that suggested that, uh, that there's potters and concepts that are going from community to community or from valley to valley within these regions. And, um, 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 and, and we think that, um, you know, um, largely from our, this evidence is some sort of ideology or religious movement as opposed to some sort of political um, uh, control. And uh, just, I just want to bring one example of, a, of at least one common motif that was found in, 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 in Salata Polychrome Pottery, and that's a, of, of, of a serpent, either a plume serpent, a horn serpent, or perhaps a feathered serpent. Um, and the serpent I iconography is uh, on, um, I think, in Patty Crown's study, 40 or 50 percent of the vessels. And um, it seems to be some sort of a powerful image. 
And if you, in this image, has links to um, um, uh, the feathered serpent, perhaps in Hopi. There's the Kolowisi at uh, at Zuni. Um, there's Pueblo and links with this, this the, the power of this the, the fertility and, and to do with f fertility and rain with the, uh, uh, the, this feathered serpent imagery. And ultimately, the, some of this imagery I think can be traced to, to Mesoamerica. So you have this salado polychrome phenomenon that's um, um, uh, we didn't discuss uh, much uh, the impact of ancestral Puebloan immigration on the Hocom world in this late period, but um, it is a minority population, but it, it's the pottery that, 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 that dominates at the end is, is, is um, uh, are very, uh, can be very much argued, it is a, is a Puebloan tradition, and this iconography I think is very powerful and has uh, um, uh, connotations for uh, integrating valleys, um, at least by religion, so. I, I think Jeff's points are well taken, and um, from an epiphenomenal perspective, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's difficult to sort of get a handle on what it, how that might be used to sort of address some of these issues we're, we're talking about tonight. I mean, I. Again, I think your point is well taken that it would be really nice from a preservation archaeology perspective if we could um, at least get further along the road to interpretation and not have to go out to the uplands and excavate lots of backhoe trenches. Uh, definitely, you know, the, from a preservation standpoint, uh, you, you raise a very good point. I'm just not sure how you can, again, sort of resolve these issues that we've been talking about tonight, even doing some iconogra iconographic analysis of, of Salado polychromes. I think maybe one way to do it is if you could incorporate both sort of Puebloan iconography with Northern Mesoamerican iconography, because just, I mean, one of the criticisms that was leveled at, you know, the, the model, the Corps Decay model at the SAA symposium was that there was too much emphasis on sort of the north and not enough emphasis on the south when in many respects uh, Hohokam just has so much of a more of a southern look to it than a northern look to it uh, and even though these um, I mean I, I, I think Jeff's data for the San Pedro River Valley are, are as good as it gets in terms of tracking prehistoric migrations and sort of identifying different cultural groups in the southwest but for the most part, these immigrant groups are along the margins, and they may have come up with ways in each valley of um, sort of in intruding into more of the mainstream, but it's still, you've got to get beyond being marginalized and to how that then sort of helps you run the show or at least um, create the... Uh, the situation for, for down the road. So again, I mean, I think there, you raise a good point, but I'm just not, personally, I don't see that it, it would really um, resolve some of these issues we've talked about. <laughs>